Okay, let's go. Hi y'all, I'm Redheaded Neighbor and welcome back to the channel, our little neighborhood here. And today we are visiting Wren again with chapter seven. And I have to say, watching these with y'all has, has really made it a lot easier. Um, if you have had a chronic illness that <laughs> was had took, took a long time to investigate to find out, or if you love someone who has had this, um, and finding getting treatment is exhausting, this seems to be the norm from <laughs> from what I've seen on forums and and different things. Um, people search on average a year before they get a correct diagnosis, and and that's usually a minimal. So just think of all the failed treatments between the start to finish. But Ren sharing his journey like this, I think. I was talking with a friend about it, and I think one of the things that makes him so powerful is that, you know, everyone does have their own story of, uh, of tragedy in their life. And so when someone can come out and be so vulnerable and share themselves so openly, and it makes us, he's so relatable. And so when he gives himself to us like that, uh, that's not that is no small thing because a lot of times it's hard to share your story and the pain you know most people don't like talking about pain and um, when he puts it out there it's like what he said <laughs> so um, yeah let's just get right into this because because Ren oops oh my ponytails might get in the way of my headphones We can run the test. Wait. Before he even had the test results, the doctor in Brussels glanced up from the form he'd asked me to fill out, and he said, you have Lyme disease. We can run the tests, but I'm certain of it. I'd heard of Lyme in passing during my hours trolling the internet, but I'd never spent long diving into it. It was an extremely rare disease in the UK that you can get from tick bites, so it never really came across my radar. I sat, sat there, puzzled for a moment. I said, um, can I get better? He said that many people go on to recover, some don't. Right. I wanted to ask him so many questions, but my mind at that moment was totally blank. The test results eventually came back, sure enough, positive for Lyme, and the co-infection Bartonella, along with many other biomarkers which suggested autoimmunity and immune dysfunction. My whole life I'd been waiting for this moment. To have something printed on a piece of paper that showed that I wasn't actually fucking crazy. <laughs> that I could shove in the faces of anyone who'd made me feel like a hypochondriac or like a head case. Yes. But when the moment finally came, I felt numb. It was hard to rejoice. I had a lingering PTSD from the psychotic meltdown the year before, which made it pretty hard to break into the rounds of happiness. Instead, I did what I always do. I got home and I took to the internet and I researched the best ways to escape. Isn't that something? Like, you just feel so much better just having a name for it, you know? Like, if you just know what to call it. But then again, at the same instance, it's like, yeah, but it didn't fix anything. The summer that I got sick, I spent two weeks camping in a small festival in Dorset. One night, me and friends decided to climb a nearby hill to build a bonfire in the woods. On the way there, the fields were full of long grass and deer. Three people, all my age, who all attended that festival came down with ME or fibromyalgia-like symptoms over the course of the next year. One was a friend of the family who was shut in a dark room for years because the light would be too intense for him. Before that festival, he was bursting with life, a successful capoeira dancer reduced to a zombie. Lyme disease seemed to be as much of a medical labyrinth as ME was. On one side, there was a whole host of specialists who believed Lyme bacteria becomes chronic, evades the immune system response, can sometimes evade testing, and leads to debilitating symptoms unless treated with a long course of antibiotics. On the other side were doctors who claimed that Lyme can't persist, it's easily treatable with a two-week course of doxycycline, and further symptoms following that must be due to an autoimmune response triggered by the Lyme, or perhaps an unrelated, undiscovered cause. 
I educated myself as best as I could on all theories, trawling through research papers on PubMed, conversing people in support groups, often contacting leading Lyme scientists via email or phone to ask them questions. Lyme disease is caused by Borrelia, a spirochete bacteria that causes symptoms like extreme fatigue, confusion, joint pain, heart problems, digestive issues, anxiety, depression, and, and in extreme cases, hallucinations. So everything was adding up. I fell down internet rabbit holes of learning how Borrelia produces outer membrane vesicles, which contain outer surface proteins which can modulate your entire immune response, essentially dampening it for its own survival. It was a truly insidious pathogen, a smart one, one out of a, trist, a twisted horror sci-fi. There would be online groups claiming it was created in a lab in Plum Island off America and weaponized. Due to the widespread suffering it seemed to cause, and given how hard it was to treat, it was easy how to see it was easy to see how people gravitated towards these sorts of superstitions and speculations. You know, um, here in the states, Lyme disease has seems to be on the rise. Uh, as a matter of fact, I have a loved one just recently diagnosed with it, and in um, following the course of antibiotics. Um, has uh alpha alpha gal uh so no animal products um because actually has an epi pin because it could trigger a severe immune response and you know i live in the country tall grass everywhere around animals we have deer so it's something like i am i legitimately think about the the lyme disease a lot you know it's it's a very frightening thing and you know i was kind of had that in the back of my mind even before i knew anything about ren and his suffering and what he had gone through and you know usually one of the the main things that they talk about is the the red bullseye marker from where the the tick bite is i'm wondering if if ren had that the main thing that made my head swim was the sheer number of treatment options in part, a byproduct of the cognitive dissonance in the medical industry at the time. There were countless antibiotic protocols, herbal protocols, immune system modulating protocols, wackier ones where people would be stinging themselves with bees or swallowing certain helminth parasites to modulate their immune systems. It was a wild west, and I wasn't so naive to be unaware that there were a lot of quacks in that space, selling people snake oil, financially taking advantage of desperation, like a lot of the medical industry. I despise people and companies who see opportunity to profit from other people's misery. If you're watching this video and you're one of those people, I would highly consider switching your role in the world and being on the right side. One common factor a lot of these protocols seem to share was you would certainly get a lot worse before you got any better. There was something called the Jarish Herxheimer reaction. As you kill off the pathogens in your system, they release biotoxins in your body, which are eventually cleared out by your kidneys and liver. These can cause systemic inflammation, additional fatigue, brain fog, mood swings, pain, flu-like feelings. I was no stranger to these things already, but when they got even worse, it was a mental battle. I sought out as many success stories as I could, and I looked for common threads in the ones of the people who made a full recovery. It seemed like long courses of antibiotics were working for some people, but to do it safely I needed to be in the care of a specialist. The NHS were fucking useless. After multiple appointments, one with an infectious disease specialist, they told me the most they could give me was a couple week course of doxycycline. I knew that probably wouldn't be enough. They told me chronic Lyme wasn't something that they recognised. I presented them with printouts of much of the research I'd gathered online. They don't care. Until they can monetize that, they don't care. For the most recent studies which they dismissed. One of them told me I seen obsessed and they asked me if I thought about getting a hobby. You seem obsessed. My entire life has stopped because of this. Yeah, I'm a little obsessed with it. I fantasized about dragging him by his tie across his desk and pressing a stapler into his skull. Then I politely got up and left. Doc I could share that. I could share that fantasy. It's infuriating. Absolutely infuriating. The cyclone would lead to improvements for a short time frame and then my symptoms would come creeping back. I tried many antibiotic and herbal approaches to treat the Lyme without much luck. I tried things like Rife treatment, which is essentially running an electromagnetic pulse through your body in hopes it will kill the bacteria. I was desperate. 
It seemed that America took Lyme disease far more seriously than the UK, which made sense as it was far more prominent there. I settled on a doctor called Dr. Jemsack over in Washington, and when I could, I would busk or I'd sell music online to raise money. My girlfriend at the time also ran a fundraiser, and my mum said that she'd also help contribute towards flights. It's not easy being sick and broke, but somehow we made it work. A week before I was due no to fly out, words. something happened which changed my whole life. I've always been a believer in the good that you're putting out in the world coming back to you. Luck, therefore, is more of a karmic consequence. When I was making video blogs, I wasn't doing it to build a following or for any sort of social merit or personal gain. I was doing it because I thought I was going to die. I was doing it because I wanted to feel like I'd left some sort of positive mark on the world, yes. like I'd helped. Yes. I remember w waking up one morning and going through the comment section of the latest video I'd posted, only to find a message from a British doctor who was running a clinic over in Germany in Los Angeles. He's the th he is the third and final angel of this story. He was reaching out to offer to help, and he didn't want anything in return. We exchanged messages and ended up jumping on a video call together. The angel explained that he sympathised with my story. His son was a musician, and at his clinic he'd seen firsthand the countless times the destruction that Lyme disease was causing. He explained his clinic was involved in cutting-edge stem cell procedures and seeing promising results for various autoimmune and Lyme patients. The cost of the procedure was upwards of $25,000, something that I could never afford. But he said that every year he personally selected patients to attend his clinic for free. Now that's going to make me cry. Because <laughs> when you go so long without hope. <laughs> he would offer me the treatment free of charge. All he wanted me to do was document my experience. It made sense to me that if Borrelia was able to modulate the immune system for its own survival, that an intervention that focused on immunological homeostasis would help. The clinic also offered antibacterial IVs targeting the Lyme and various other treatments intended to build the body back up after years of chronic health complications. I was kind of in shock. When a stranger reaches out and offers something so generous, it's natural to doubt his intentions, but something told me to trust this kind offer. I really had nothing to lose, and as morbid as it sounds, my willingness to die made it easy to throw myself into a more experimental procedure. There was also some security in the fact that he wanted me to document my experience and share it with the world. If it had been more sinister, surely he wouldn't want that sort of exposure. I decided that I'd still go to the in in initial consultation with Dr. Jemsek as I'd raised the money, but I would catch a flight to LA once it was done. Money was still an issue. The entire treatment length was about six weeks, and back then I could have never afforded the accommodation for that long. I decided to hop on Facebook, and I found a Lyme support group based in LA. There, I found people going through the treatment at the clinic who were happy to put me up in their guest rooms. Despite all our faults, Human beings' ability to empathise, lift up strangers, and collectively solve problems purely because it's the right thing to do is such a beautiful characteristic to carry. You know, that is so true. That is so true. I've found a lot of times people that are in the throes of struggle and pain themselves are usually the ones who have the empathy and the heart to help someone else who is suffering. Because a lot of times if you don't know suffering, if you don't know struggle, if you don't know pain, it's, it's so unimaginable to you that it's just like, pick yourself up by your bootstraps. You know, you need to just just get up and go. Like, what's what's the problem? Sometimes we need help. I sincerely hope that we can find ways to hold on to our own empathy and humanity as we step into the future. I believe these traits will save us as a species. Survival of the fittest is a myth in a society where we have all our basic needs met. It becomes survival of those willing to cooperate. The time came and I flew out to America with Momoko, keeping me company and keeping an eye out in case my health crashed. I went to the initial consultation in Washington DC. They re recommended that I get on a minimum of a year long course of various antibiotics and supplements, some to be rotated. I saw this as my fallback plan if the stem cells didn't work. We then headed to LA. It was summertime, so it was boiling. The clinic was based in Beverly Hills. The juxtaposition of spending most of my life in waiting rooms that were falling apart, feeling like a defective product on a conveyor belt that's being rushed along only to be dismissed, to then go into being in what felt like a five-star health spa where there seemed to be a genuine care and interest for my well-being was quite odd. I was greeted enthusiastically by the doctor. He seemed a lot younger than his age. When I mentioned this, he laughed and he said it was the stem cells. As we spoke, I could see his childlike enthusiasm for what they were doing at the clinic. 
Stem cells were very in vogue at the time. There was also much territory to explore and the potential of what they could offer harder to treat diseases was incredibly exciting and promising. It was hard not to feel some of that contagious excitement leaking from the doctor. He explained that because I've been sick and misdiagnosed for so long, it wasn't going to be easy. There was no magic fix. At times I might feel like giving up, but I should trust the process. So I did. When we first arrived, I was staying on the floor of a young couple's apartment. They were just starting treatment at the clinic. Fontaine was a songwriter and he was an actor. One night he asked me if I liked bikes and then he took me out on the back of his Harley Davidson and drove at high speed through the hills surrounding LA. It was interesting talking to Fontaine about her experience. I'd found people I could relate to online, but very rarely did I meet people in person whose experience had mirrored my own. She'd also been through the ringer of misdiagnoses, medical dismissal, left to suffer, trying desperately to claw back her own life. I started to realize this problem wasn't localized to the UK. It was global. So many people were going missing and screaming into a void. Absolutely. And that void will just swallow you up because, you know, a lot of times you have to wait a long time to get to that appointment. And then when you're dismissed or you're told it's your fault or whatever, it's terrifying. You know, it's like you overthink every step of the way. Dress any deficiency. Oops. That may have occurred from years of being sick. They also offer talk therapy, lymphatic drainage massage, ways to calm your nervous system that would aid healing. I was still having to pinch myself that this was all free. I felt guilty for the people who had to pay. It wasn't easy. Occasionally I'd have an immune reaction to one of the IV drips. I didn't know at the time, but I had mast cell activation syndrome, which meant my body would become highly inflamed in response to many food, vitamins, even things like perfumes or scents from everyday cleaning products could set it off. A year later, while in the German clinic, I would be minutes away from nearly dying after going into anaphylactic shock during an IV drip. A nurse luckily caught me in the nick of time and injected me with an EpiPen. I spent a night in the emergency ward with Germans who couldn't speak a word of English who put me on an electrolyte drip that made me feel even worse. During the second week in LA, I moved places to stay with another couple. The husband had been a prop and set designer for the Fresh Prince of Bel Air. <laughs> they were extremely generous with their time and space and became almost surrogate parents to me and Momoko. There is an unusual companionship you feel with someone who has faced similar levels of suffering as yourself, like yeah. an unspoken bridge of understanding. Yeah. At the time, I was having difficulties with my girlfriend. I wanted her to come with me to LA as this felt like a pretty pivotal moment in my life. It was a time where I really just wanted to feel safe, but she couldn't take the time off work. I think I felt a little bit funny about the fact Momoko had made the time and, and sacrificed her own work and she hadn't. She was being distant with me whenever we spoke on the phone, which frustrated me more and more. We ended up arguing a fair bit. I think this was the beginning of seeds that would soon grow into finding it extremely difficult to be in relationships in general. I usually feel pretty unlovable, extremely isolated, very antisocial. I felt alienated, often bitter that most people go through their lives not knowing what it's like to hurt every day. <laughs> that they didn't appreciate the freedom their bodies allowed them as they should. To be alive and to not hurt is a blessing. Yes. To be alive and not hurt is all I want. The day, the day of the stem cell transplant finally arrived, and I was nervous, as you would be getting a giant fucking metal rod shoved into your skin. The doctors offered me an anti-anxiety med, and I was never one to turn down free drugs. With autologous stem cell transplant, they take cells from your own fat, centrifuge them, and then do some magic science shit and then feed them back to you in an IV. To acquire these cells, they have to do liposuction. The issue was I was already skinnier than a shadow on a cloudy day. Yeah. They would usually take the fat from the stomach, but as they had virtually no body fat, they had to go in through the back near my coccyx. Oh, my word. No. Yeah, I don't think I'd have a problem getting what they needed for that procedure, but that sounds horrible. They spent about 20 minutes soaring away at your insides and separating your muscle from fat. Then they inject you with a liquid that breaks it down and they suck it back out fresh for the stem cell harvest. There's a video of me drugged up and laughing as a needle as big as my forearm gets rammed into my back. I returned home pretty bruised up, but full of hope. Like, uh, like they're digging for gold. And um, so I'm pretty kind of bruised up. I've got these two little holes here where they took the stem cells out and they put them back in my arm. You can't really see on this camera because of the light's too much, but I've got more holes in my arm than a Scottish heroin addict. I'd met people at the clinic who were further along the process than me, who were singing the praises of how much better they felt. 
For the first three months, I didn't really notice much, but I was told it would take time. I was already doing ba somewhat better from the six weeks of IVs. It's an unusual psychological space to be teetering on the precipice of hope that your whole life could change. There's a certain tension and a certain excitement that comes with that. I was also having big problems with my girlfriend at the time. I'd found out some things that had really shaken my trust. In retrospect, I should have just walked away then and there, but I held on because part of me blamed myself. In my sickness, I held people at a distance, so I felt like I deserved negative things. We would fight a lot. The health problems added a whole new dimension to something that would be hard for any couple. I couldn't trust that she loved me as much as she said she did because of certain things that I found out. A few months after the transplant, me and her decided to get away from everything and stay with her mother on the south of Spain. One night, we were sat on the grass, looking up at the sky, being surrounded by avocado and lemon trees. It felt like we were in some sort of Eden-like paradise. She asked me to marry her. It was her way of proving that she loved me and would always love me. And I said yes, but I meant no. Even when we went to pick out rings, I just felt scared. I lost the ability to trust love. I don't fully blame her for that. She was an awesome person trying to navigate a complicated situation. Yeah, honestly, that's a very difficult situation. And for both of them. <laughs> yeah, they, they both had a very difficult thing. I blame my sickness. My sickness was an inseparable for me. And so I blame myself. After about a month of being home, she sat down with me one day and told me to, she decided to move to Australia for a year. She told me it wouldn't change anything between us. I have my doubts. She's moving to Australia. Things are gonna be different. <laughs> Despite the additional stress in my life, something amazing was happening. About four months after the stem cell transplant, I noticed the, the desire to leave the house. I noticed more color in my skin. I joined a gym that was a three minute walk from my house. I started working out for the first time in years. Music started pouring back into my life. I was singing more. I was producing more. And this was all leading up to my favorite chapter so far. Trying to talk about a cause to get my spoken word 
dry And I try to keep my studs alive And this life it can be ish right Caught you like a flip knife Twist and make you sick right And I feel That these bad thoughts were gone That's a song that me and Ren wrote. Uh, if you want to follow us on Instagram, it's uh, Ren Makes Music. That's R E N Makes Music. I am Sam Tompkins UK. That's Sam T O M P K I N S UK. This next song is called Same Old Situation. We wrote this not so long ago. Uh, Ren Makes Music. That's it. <laughs> that lady at the end just asking, you know, about it making sure I get this right because I want to follow. I don't know how anybody could see these, see them on the street and not have that same reaction. Like, yeah, I want to follow because wow. <laughs> you know, going through this journey with him, I feel like there's just an even deeper connection, like not just with him, but like with us the fans, the renegades, and I think that is a big part of the intention here. Um, it's drawing attention to these these causes, the ME and Lyme, um, but also I think there's just a, a need for people to be there for each other, you know, like, and it only happens when it's intentional. You know, and it's like, you can't help everyone, but you can help someone. And you could be an angel in someone's story. And you will never know, like for you, it could be some small thing. But for someone else, it can change their life. So, yeah, I've absolutely, I'm loving, I'm loving this series. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for being here. And um, make sure you go give Ren his love and his flowers because he needs it. He deserves it. And until next time, y'all, thank you for joining me. And you, you really do make me smile. You really do. Thank you for that. <laughs>